and we're live again. Hey everybody, happy June 24th. Hope you're on your way to having a great, great weekend. Uh, Donna Schwartz here from DonnaSchwartzMusic.com, the place for practical tips to help improve your music performance skills. So today I wanted to address some questions that some of my subscribers to my newsletter had this week. And by the way, if you want to subscribe to my newsletter, every week I have practical tips, either in video or in an article form, that uh, only you see, for the most part. Sign up at DonnaSchwartzMusic.com. So the first question was from Lou, when he asked about doodle tonguing. And he was nice enough to send me a video of Clark Terry teaching a master class on this. I think it was at the New School. And uh, for those of us that are into jazz, we all know that Clark Terry is a big name obviously in the jazz field, uh, great trumpet player, funny guy, great stories. Uh, if anything, you've got to check out the video of Mumbles. Hey, Greg. Uh, you got to check out Clark Terry's Mumbles. It's hysterical. <laughs> it's really funny. Actually, Clark Terry's Mumbles reminds me of my grandfather. My grandfather, um, you'd always play pranks. My family was a family of pranks, and I do that too um, all through my teaching years or the later part of my teaching years in New York, I used to play pranks on everybody. The teachers dreaded it because they never knew what to expect. <laughs> Neither did I, because I just came up with it on the fly. And I even got all the students involved, too. It was really great. Anyway, so my grandfather, I remi I'm reminded uh, when I hear Clark Terry's mumbles, because my, my grandfather would joke around like that, too. He would actually, uh, <laughs> hey, Greg, he would actually... Um, get on the phone. Yes, the landline phone, for those of you that don't know what that is, he'd get on the landline phone and he'd just start making up gibberish and he'd start, hey Maria, woo! <laughs> he'd start talking gibberish, like he'd call up like a Chinese food restaurant and just talk gibberish and he'd pretend to have a conversation. So Clark Terry's mumbles reminded me of that. Anyway, anywho, this is a video about, um, I wanted to talk about jazz articulation because again, I had a bunch of questions and again, Lou asked about doodle tonguing. Listen, whenever you do any kind of articulation, Linda, hey, whenever you do any kind of articulation, you have to think about what you're doing first. You can't just expect to put the horn up to your face, whether it's a, you know, trumpet or a saxophone, and just, you know, it's going to work. You have to be very clear in your mind what syllables you want to say. You know, so if you're not clear in your mind, that's, crap's going to come out, okay? But if you're thinking, for example, uh, the syllable two, 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 two. That's a very pronounced two. Two, two, two by four, four. It's a very pronounced two. If I'm th thinking the syllable do, it's more connected style. So, Lou, this is going into that doodle tonguing. The doodle tonguing uses a combination of the do syllable, obviously doodle, right? <clears throat> and also stopping notes too. But you know what? I don't want you thinking about, I've got to place my tongue at this exact angle and hitting this exact spot. If you do that, you're going to mess yourself up, okay? It, it would really screw your head up. The best thing to do when you're tonguing is to think, um, to just imitate nature. So when he says doodle tonguing, in that video that you sent me, he was talking about Daedle doodle, right? Daedle doodle doddle diddle. Daedle doodle doddle diddle. So just say that a few times. Notice what your tongue is doing in your mouth. Okay? Now, it's easier on a trumpet. Why? Hey, Lou, I'm answering your question right now. It's easier on a trumpet. Why? This is outside your mouth. It's not inside your mouth. If you play the trumpet like this, you're in trouble. <laughs> Sorry, I had to put that in there. So doodle tonguing or any kind of articulation is a lot easier on a trumpet and a flute. It's harder on a clarinet and a saxophone. And I can tell you from teaching for many, many trillions of years, from the dinosaur ages, <laughs> no, from teaching for a long time, uh, especially for beginner students, it's really hard to articulate because you've got this, this mouthpiece in your mouth and you've got to touch the tip of the reed and it's, it's clunky, it's weird, and at first it stings your tongue and it's really irritating. And for some kids or some beginners, when they start to articulate, and their, the tip of their tongue is touching the tip of the reed, it stings. They want nothing to do with that, and they stop articulating. So here's the thing. You just have to be very clear-minded in how you approach articulation. Here's how I teach people. I usually have them imitate the syllables. I'll say the syllables out loud. They say it back. So I'll go, um, 
Do, 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 do. They say it back. Do, 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 do. Always saying to them, be very aware of where your tongue's hitting in your mouth. Even if you're a reed player, okay? Um, then I'll say, do it in air sounds. Then you do that back. And when you're doing it back, notice where your tongue's hitting your mouth. Again, it's easier on a brass instrument. Then the next thing you do is you do the air sounds in the instrument. Being really aware of where your tongue's hitting in your mouth. Next step for trumpet, close the lips. Hey, John. I was imitating what I did over here. And I just closed my lips. Now, for the doodle tonguing. Doodle doo. This is something that you've got to really think about. Doodle 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 diddle daddle doodle doodle. Just try not to move your jaw too much when you're doing it. It's very similar to that connected style of articulation, do tonguing, um, except you could be a little bit more extreme with the stopping of the tongue. Do -do 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 -do. So what happens is your, your tongue is stopping the air on the upbeat. Let me do it on one note. I'll do it on F. And what Clark Terry said in the, um, in the video at the time, you know, people would, didn't have very good technique. So what they do is they would use their vocal cords. Now would never, never, never teach a beginner to do that. That's the worst thing. Okay. This is a sound effect. Um, but that's what they would do, and they'd get that raspy sound. Okay, beginners, no, don't do that. Don't dare do that. In fact, a lot of beginners I found, um, they, they, they didn't understand that they weren't supposed to use their vocal cords. A lot of books say, imitate the syllable two when you tongue. So they'd go, two. <laughs> I can't even do it, but they, they'd say two while they're trying to blow the air, and it took a long time to break them from that habit. So using the air sounds is really going to help when you're, um, when you're learning articulation. So Lou, the short answer to your question, how do you do the doodle tonguing? You've got it. You just got to practice it, but first you got to practice it away from the horn, okay? Whether it's a trumpet or a saxophone, you got to sit there and go doodle diddle doodle doodle do, and... Be very aware of what your tongue's hitting in your mouth, okay, and what your tongue's doing. Doodle diddle doodle diddle 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 Sounds like mumbles. <laughs> it really does. But the other thing, too, I would really strongly encourage you, and when I get into this next section, you know, other people who especially are teachers, you've got to put on listening examples. You've got to listen to a lot of great jazz players. If you want to do doodle tonguing, listen to a lot of Clark Terry. I don't care if you play the bass guitar, <laughs> okay? Um, or if you play a saxophone, listen to Clark Terry if you want to do the doodle tonguing, okay? Do what Lou did and he sent me the YouTube video. Very cool. Listen to how he taught those folks. Now, yes, he was in his very, very later years, so it's a little harder for him. But granted, the guy's playing until he's like 95. That's freaking amazing. But the thing, though, is that you have to do, be very aware of what's going on inside your mouth and how you do it. I could say to you, okay, the tip of your tongue's got to touch, this is your top teeth, it's got to touch right there on the tip. No, it doesn't. That's how, what maybe works for me. And that's where people get other people, other students in trouble. We can't tell a student specifically where to put their tongue in the exact spot. We can say, you know, a lot of people tend to tongue behind their top teeth for brass instruments. Some people tongue great behind their, the bottom teeth, on the, the very edge of the bottom teeth, okay? So... Really, the best thing is to imitate nature. And that's, that's what, you know, that's how I teach, just imitating nature. So if I'm grabbing a saxophone, I'm grabbing a tenor. You got this mouthpiece in your mouth. So what you're thinking, doodle 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 doodle. Some people are going to do the doodle tongue a little bit, um, a little differently. They may get a little bit more of that, um, 
the stop sound on the upbeat. <laughs> They may do that. Okay, they may do it differently than me. That's cool. That's fine. Um, do I use doodle tonguing? I don't think so, but, you know, honestly, when I'm playing jazz, I'm going off... Sorry about that. I had a phone call. <laughs> I'm going... When I'm doing jazz, I'm going after um, all the years of hearing jazz and what I like, you know, what I don't like and stuff, and I'm just, just hearing that in my head and trying to... Uh... <laughs> hey, Santino! Woohoo! By the way, I have a gig tonight at the Moose Lodge in La Habra, okay, at se uh, 7 to 10 p.m. So guys, if you're, if you're around, if you're around the uh, Los Angeles, Orange County area, come on down. It's a really nice place. Really is a nice place. Really cool. And uh, he said, I don't drink, but the drinks are supposedly cheap. So that's really cool. Uh, I'm with the Honey Drops with that band. So check it out. Um, anyway, so um, I've lost my train of thought. Yeah, with, with the articulation, it's really all about listening. So how, now here's the next section. If you're um, a teacher of jazz band, especially beginner jazz band, or let's say middle school jazz band, you've got to focus on the articulation. But you don't sit there and, and go, do da do da do da do That is the wrong way to tone, okay? The best way to, to do it, before your rehearsal starts, put on a recording on a boom box, if you even know what that is, <laughs> or on your computer, playing your iTunes. Put on recordings of great players, okay? Um, Sonny Rollins, right? Um, obviously Clark Terry, um, Clifford Brown, um, Freddie Hubbard, you know, all, all these folks, right? Put on some great recordings, a different one each day. And then you take a few minutes, you know, at the beginning of rehearsal and say, um, hey kids, you know, this recording is such and such a tune by such and such a player. Here's what I want you to listen for. And you tell them what to listen for. They're listening as they're getting all their instruments ready. And then you talk about it for like two minutes or so. Okay, and then you go on from there. The more that you do that, the better off they're going to get in terms of understanding and assimilating jazz articulation. Does that make sense? Let me know with a, yeah, <laughs> even if you're not a jazz player. Just, just say something to me so I know that I'm not talking into my iPad, which is on my music stand. Say hi. <laughs> um, so if you're teaching beginning jazz, that's the way I would start off a rehearsal. You know, um, if you if you don't have the time to start off the rehearsal that way, thanks, Lou. Um, if you don't, put it in your lessons, in your weekly lessons during the week. Even if you've got a mixed group, you know, and it's you know flutes, clarinets, and trumpets. So what? Put on a great recording. One week, one week make it classical. Next week, make it jazz. Okay, flutes and clarinets can play jazz also. They may not be, you know, the featured instrument in a jazz band, but still, anyone can play jazz. I mean, if you, if you don't believe me, check out Michael Rabinowitz, great jazz bassoonist. I think he's based in New York City. I knew about him for many, many years um, when I was actually growing up. Um, so articulation is really key. Now, if you know your kids are not listening to jazz music at home, and that's, I know it, I get it, I lived it, I know it. Um, that's why you, you have to do this in, at school, at work. Just keep playing the recordings, and then for one of those kids or a couple of those kids, something's going to click just like that. Going to be like, oh, crap. That's a, Well, they won't say that. I will. They'll say, oh, crap. <laughs> That's an awesome recording. I, I want to learn how to play that. You know, like um, Freddie Hubbard's tune, Red Clay. Cool tune, right? Okay. Sugar by Stanley Tarantine. He's one of my favorite saxophone players. Love that tune. Okay. Um, Gibraltar also. Awesome tune. Friggin' awesome tune. Just play different things for them. Get them hooked that way. And then the more they listen, they're just going to naturally do it. All right? Now, the next part of your jazz band rehearsal, and even your concert band rehearsal, too, always use call and response. The best way to learn music is to hear it. And you're hearing it, you're assimilating it, you're playing it back. You're hearing it, you're assimilating it, you're singing it back. Okay? So you could start off with, let's say, um, just one note, like a concert F pitch, right? So that's a G on the tenor, it's a D on the alto, um, G on the trumpet. You know, just taking that pitch and going... Just emphasizing the... Doo -da -doo -da -doo -da -doo -da -da. You know, like that, emphasizing the upbeats. One note. You could have your drummer your, on your drum set Just doing a just doing a you know a swing beat or something like that. So 
Sometimes you can emphasize rock rhythms with the drum, with the, uh, with the drum section, um, with the drummer and, you know, any percussion that you have. Um, all the other instruments can do this exercise to work on their, their jazz articulation, their jazz phrasing, all that kind of stuff. And then you start to add another note. You know, let's say uh, concert F and concert G. And then they play it back, okay? Uh, after a while, once I get them comfortable with call and response, I don't show them my fingers, okay? I want them to use their ears. Now, yes, some of us are visual learners, myself especially included, but I, I, we need to develop the ears. That's just, the, you know, that's just what it is for music. So once they know the sound of the concert F and the concert G, you turn your back. Like, I'm going to turn my back on you so you can see my really lovely Van Dorn F and H harness, right? <laughs> Okay, and then you have them play it back. Hey, Alvin. <laughs> um, okay, so, you know, call and response. Now, here's the other thing, too, that people um, don't talk about too much and, uh, or they get confused about. One of the, and let me have a preface this again also, too. I judged, for many years, I judged beginning brass, uh, not brass, beginning brass, brass, uh, NISMA, and also jazz NISMA. NISMA is New York State, <laughs> hey, hi Alvin, uh, NISMA is New York State School Music Association. And I've judged their, the NISMA festivals for, oh my gosh, I think it's 17 years now. But I'm very young, I did it when I was 10. Now anyway, um, so I'd see kids come in for jazz auditions, and they would, uh, two things, their articulation would be, Da da Thinking that that was jazz. That's not jazz. That's um, I don't know what that is. <laughs> it's it's it, I, no. Anyway, it's not jazz. Um, jazz is listening. It's do da do da do da do da. Now here's the thing. <sighs> Let me actually. I don't want to. I don't want to overstep. The second thing I'd see is that for the improvisation part, if it was a blues, they'd invariably play whatever blues scale for the key for the tune. So if it was concert B-flat blues, they'd be going... They would just play the blues scale, like kind of down and up and all around, and then, you know... And they would emphasize like the the flat three, uh, that was the E flat on this one, and then the sharp four, the F sharp. They'd hang out in those notes a little too much, in the wrong spots, and but they wouldn't know that that wasn't the best thing to do. So here's here's the thing. I know when I was first taught jazz, I was taught to listen first, but I was also taught just use your blues scale, and just play along that you know through for a blues. So you know you got pretty good at it. Um, but the thing is that you didn't understand how it really functioned. The better way to approach teaching jazz, you could just take your major scale, and I alluded to this last week in my last week Facebook Live session, which by the way, do me a favor guys, can you keep sharing this, this little Facebook link thingamajig, we get more people on, and if you have questions, ask them. I will try to answer, if I don't have the answer, I'll look it up, okay? That's how it works, that's how I teach, I am not God, I don't know everything, I just know what I've experienced throughout my life. So please share. That would be cool. Double thumbs up. All right. Anyway, um, in terms of teaching jazz, take a major scale. And what you're really looking for, as Tim Price calls it, it's the authentic jazz language. It's the articulation. It's the style. Listen to a lot of jazz. Just take two notes and play patterns back and forth. So if I take, um, I'll take a concert B flat scale and on tenor it's C and D. So, you know, I'll just go, and then the students would imitate it back. Students would imitate it back, you know? Again, same thing. Once that's good, once they have a grasp of that, you add the third note. C, D, E, Do, Re, Mi. They imitate it back. They imitate it back. 
They imitate it back. Now I'm doing a swing style right now, and I'm going to talk about something else in a second. Um, you keep, you know, you keep adding a note as they're able to handle it. Once you hit the point where they're getting messed up because there's too many note choices, that's the point you stop. And you go back one note, like if they got messed up if I added the fourth note, go back to three notes and continue to do patterns. And then the next time, start with three notes and then add the four. Okay, now here's the mis... No, it's not a mistake. Um, here's another approach too. You know, bebop is not do da do da do. It's it's not that. It's really more straight apes with an emphasis on the upbeat. Do da do da do da do da do da do da do. The best way to practice that, obviously, to do listening. Listen to bebop players, right? Charlie Parker, obviously. Duh. You know, um, Dizzy Gillespie, that kind of thing. But what you want to do, you could take one note and, you know, play straight eighth notes and just emphasize the upbeats. The other thing you could do is take the bebop scale with the flat seven and the regular seven. Okay, start on the upper note and go down. So, not that fast, though. You, you start off really slow. You know, you show, uh, make, make sure that the kids know what the scale is, and then really slow. You could do it in quarter notes, and you can have your drummer go ching, 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 ching on the two and the four, ching, 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 four on the floor, two and four on the, on the ride. Ching, 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 ching. Have them get really comfortable with that scale because that is another option of scale choice to use for the blues. And if the kids learn your typical, I'm going to call it a rock blues, where there's, you know, um, there's a five and the four at the end instead of the two five. If they start with like the rock blues, they just need to know three, three uh, bebop scales. Right, the one, the four, and the five. Okay, so that's another thing that you can think about too as a teacher and also as a beginning improviser too. So, should you not learn your blues scale? No, of course, learn your blues scale. Learn the bebop scale also and get that articulation down where it's do da do da do da, just the emphasis on the upbeats or on the two and the four. Does that make sense or am I just talking out of my ass? <laughs> like my language? It's awesome. I did this in school too. No, actually I didn't. I, I, I was PG rated. It was really hard, really hard to do. Okay. Um, another question that someone had, and this is a great question. And this is, this is, um, this is a challenging question. Let me get the horn off my neck. Even though I have this amazing harness. Okay. Amazing harness. Thank you, Van Doren. You're amazing. The FNH harness. I'm telling you, use it. Uh, by the way, I I'd recently gone to, um, Vitello's to, Vitello's to see a really great uh, uh, jazz show and um, oh, kicking myself. I forgot the Barry Sachs player's name. Really great player. Um, he's playing with um, Steely Dan right now and he had my harness on. I was like, that was awesome. This, this takes the weight of the horns really great. Okay, last question because I tend to talk too much and you guys aren't. Oh, thanks, Lou. Makes sense. Good. Talk back to me. Come on. You see, I talk too much, but talk back to me. All right, anyway. Um, this is a, a great question that uh, one, of, one of my subscribers had, had asked me. How do I get into a top tier band or how can, how can I get a top tier band or player to hire me? This is a hard question. You know, it, what it has to do with is you, number one, being very aware of your skill set, okay? Um, having confidence in yourself but not being arrogant Okay, you got to have some sense of humbleness. You got to know your stuff, okay, as much as possible, but you also have to set a goal. So, um, just to give you an example, years ago, uh, I was I was in a really low spot, and uh, I had made it a great a great accomplishment in another area of my life, and then I was like, oh crap, what am I going to do now? And you'll find this too, like you set a goal and you reach it, and then if you don't have something a goal set after that, you kind of hit a funk. And I hit a funk for a while. 
and then I started to get some injuries to, I got injuries to both my shoulders and that really made it fun for playing. I had a hard time. And then the voice came on. Now, I don't like a lot of reality shows. I don't like American Idol. And I didn't like it because it was freaking negative. I don't like when people make fun of people in public. I love playing pranks, but I want people to laugh with me, okay? I don't want to be laughed at, all right? And I just didn't like American Idol because it was just so freaking negative. Is the music industry tough and rough? Yeah, it absolutely is. But you know what? We don't have to shame people in public. You just don't. Everybody has their, their particular strengths and skills. That's awesome. So um, when The Voice came on, I was like, oh, I don't know. But my wife encouraged me. She said, let's just watch it. I watched it and I was hooked. And actually what really got me was that one of the performers I really connected with. And I was like, you know, I just, I love the way she sings. And I could just relate. It's something about her voice I could just relate to. And I could just see myself playing the saxophone with her because I know we'd be a great fit. I know it. I know it. And I started to follow her. I started to, I started to create a goal for myself, a direction. Okay. Big goal was to be able to perform with this person. And by the way, it was Vicky Martinez from season one. She was a finalist from The Voice. Hey, Vicky, if you watch this, this, uh, this replay. So I set a goal for myself. I, I need to perform with her because I know we're, we're a good fit. I know it. I know it. She sings in the style that I play. It's friggin' awesome. And so I had certain steps that I did to achieve that, um, little steps at a time. And, you know, I got to know her. I became friends with her. I became friends with friends of her, all that kind of stuff. I got to know her music really, really well. And I wanted to. It's freaking awesome. The band that she played with was just amazing. Amazing. They're in the, uh, the Tacoma, Seattle area. Great players. Holy crap. Um, you know, Rod Cook, um, um, oh my gosh, I, I, Jeff, Darren, I, um, Eric, you know, Eric, who's, uh, who's, uh, Eric Robert, who's touring with all these, these great bands right now on keyboards, you know, great players. And I eventually reached that goal. So, and she's a top tier musician for me and for a lot of people. So how did I do it? I just took advantage of opportunities and you know, was humble about it. And I just worked on my skills, improved my skills, learned her, learned her songs really, really well. And I performed with her not once, but twice. The first time, um, it was great. She had me up there as a guest and she asked me back, um, you know, in another city a couple of days later. So this question was for someone that couldn't attend um, this session on Facebook today. That's, that's cool though. Hopefully he'll watch this for this particular part. Hey guys, did this, did this help you? You know, am I just, again, am I just talking out of my butt or something like that? Or, or did this, you know, help you out at least a little bit? Give me a yes, no, thumbs down, hooray, go back to bed, <laughs> something, tell me something. Um, makes sense not to, uh, uh, does it make sense not to like jazz, but love to listen to blues? Oh, okay. So in other words, you're more into the blues as opposed to jazz. Is that it, Lou? I'm just trying to understand the question. I know people are furiously typing fast and all that kind of stuff. Um, if that's what you're asking, yeah, listen, I'm not going to tell you what to like or not like. You you like what you like. You know what I'm saying? Um, I'm more of a blues player and, okay, good. Uh, thanks, Lou. I'm more of a blues player and I'm getting more and more into jazz. For many years in New York, New York, I played rock. Okay, that was my thing. Rock, Motown, soul, funk, all that kind of stuff. Not very much jazz. It wasn't the places I was playing. Um, it wasn't, you know, it just wasn't what I was doing. Could I play it? Yeah. You know, I had definitely had some training in it. And one of the bands that I was with, um, when we played a certain gig out in the Hamptons with Soul Patch, awesome band, um, we do a jazz set to start off the night. So, you know, it just wasn't my, my thing. I love listening to it, um, but I didn't get a chance to play it that much. I'm out here in LA. Yeah, I'm playing it a lot more. So I'm listening to it, you know, even more than, than what I've done in the past. Listen to what you want to listen to. And then, you know, if blues is your thing, you know, still, I would say, listen to Stanley Tarantine. Um, uh, gosh, I can see these people's faces and it's driving me nuts. You should still listen to Cannonball Adderley. Still listen to Charlie Parker. Um, Fathead Newman, listen to him too. Um, you should listen to King Curtis. Holy crap. Yeah. Okay. King Curtis, definitely, because you want that, those kind of stylings. 
okay? And just a saxophone player, you know? So listen to great players and then listen to great blues players and don't just listen to saxophone players. Listen to guitar players. A lot of people tend to say that my solos are like guitar on a saxophone. And they don't mean the crazy, you know, psychotic riffs or anything. It's just, it's just the way I approach it. Why? Because those are, that was what my experience is. You know, many years playing with bands where guitar was the lead. That's just what it is. Okay. All right. I'm over 30 minutes right now. Again, I hope this was helpful, helpful for you, to you, whatever. Um, when the replay comes out, please share it on your social networks. That would really help me. And again, if you want to subscribe to my newsletter where you get weekly tips and all other kind of craziness and stuff, DonnaSchwartzMusic.com. The freebie you get now, it's a good one. It's three tips to help fatten up your saxophone tone. Okay, so if you sign up, definitely you'll get that. Now, if you're the type of person that's like really confused about practicing and stuff like that, I've got another, another freebie for you too. You can get this other freebie if you sign up for the fattened saxophone tone freebie, but you can also just get this thing, the ultimate practice planner, if you do a search on my site for maximize your practice using the rule of tens. And with that, the freebie is my ultimate practice planner and it's helped out I'm going to say hundreds of people at this point and not just players, but teachers as well, because we always say to people, practice, practice. Well, what the mm, does that mean? Okay. We don't know what it means until someone structures it out for us. So check out those two things, either the fatten your saxophone tone in three steps where you'll get the planner also eventually, or maximize your practice using the rule of tens. That's a blog article I put out. And that freebie is on that page. Okay, so on that note, <laughs> thanks, Lou. On that note, take care. Have a great weekend. Have a great day. Take care.